Um, okay, let's go. Hi, Dr. Gerland. It's a great pleasure to be with you today for um, this interview with the Microbiome Foundation on the COVID and the microbiome. Dr. Gerland, um, you are a board certified internist. You're a graduate from Harvard, an international best selling author, and also one of the pioneers of uh, functional medicine. Research um, on COVID has started unraveling the link between COVID and the microbiome in the sense that the microbiome is both a predictor of how people respond to COVID, but it's also um, important to understand through research that the microbiome is impacted in many ways by COVID. As we all know, um, the microbiome is one of the key pillars of our health, both in chronic and infectious diseases. And it's my pleasure to be with Dr. Gallen today to go more in depth in this understanding of how um, COVID, long COVID and the microbiome interact. Thank you, Dr. Gallen. Uh, thank you for having me give this presentation. Uh, what I'd like to do is to uh, just give a little background on the microbiome, the relationship between the microbiome and acute COVID, and then move on to the relationship between the gut microbiome and long COVID and potential treatments that may be helpful. Uh, the microbiome covers every millimeter of every surface of our bodies from the skin to the inside of the gastrointestinal tract. It acts like a bioreactor that is programmed to synthesize molecules that direct our immune systems and modify the expression of our genes and regulate our metabolism. It is not just a collection of microbes that we have to deal with. It is integrated into our physiology at every level. And Almost all the chemicals that circulate in our blood originate with the microbiome, even if they're changed by our own organs. Your microbiome is like your own personal cloud. It goes with you and is shed wherever you go. In fact, forensic scientists can tell who is in a room by examining the bacterial DNA in that room, because that DNA comes from the microbiome of each individual. We each have a unique microbiome that is shaped by many factors, diet, hygiene, environment, which includes the people you live with, your culture, the pets in your home, and the place, hormones, stress, exercise, your personal medical history, early life experience, and your personal genetics all shape the nature of your microbiome. The gut microbiome is your body's largest and most diverse ecosystem, followed by the mouth. There are about 100 trillion microbes, almost you know, 95 percent of the total. And there are more microbial cells and much more microbial DNA in your gut microbiome than there is than there are human cells or human DNA in your body. Dysbiosis is a concept that's important to understand we're talking about the microbiome in relationship to health and illness. And dysbiosis is an imbalance or an instability among the many organisms of the microbiome that alters the ecosystem, creating undesirable effects on the health of the host. Leaky gut is another concept that is closely related to dysbiosis. That is a decrease in the integrity of the intestinal lining, producing a state of hyperpermeability that allows toxins inside the gut to be readily absorbed into the body and may also allow the increased translocation of intestinal microbes into blood. Now, there's a significant impact of stress on the microbiome. Stress hormones like um, adrenaline and noradrenaline selectively encourage the growth of some pathogenic bacteria. E. coli has been studied in that regard. In addition, adrenaline can make bacteria like E. coli produce toxins. And these toxic bacteria break down the intestinal barrier, creating leakiness, which then allows greater present penetration of toxins into your body. It's kind of like a vicious cycle. Now, inflammation and the microbiome creates a very definite vicious cycle through nitric oxide and nitrates. The body's response to in inflammation 
is to synthesize nitric oxide. Nitric oxide breaks down into nitrates. And so where there is inflammation, there is an increase in nitrate concentration in the inflamed organ. A high nitrate environment changes bacterial growth patterns. We've seen this in streams where the release of nitrates from things like detergents alters the microbes in the streams. Well, in your body, a high nitrate environment um, stunts the growth of anti-inflammatory bacteria, encourages the growth of pro-inflammatory bacteria. And as their growth increases, there's more inflammation. And so you have a, a feed forward loop where inflammation begets more inflammation through the nitrate effect on bacterial growth patterns. Now in understanding the microbiome, there are two important questions to answer. The first is who's there? And the second is what do they do? Well, who's there are bacteria, at least a thousand different species in each person, viruses, which outnumber the bacteria, maybe 35 to one. Most of these viruses are what are called phages. That is, they live within the bacteria. They're bacteriophages. They're also fungi, mostly yeast, about 15 species. Archaea are more primitive than bacteria, but they look like them. They produce methane. Protozoa are one-celled animals. And then many people, uh, historically, most people in the world had worms or helmets. Now, these organisms are divided into a taxonomy, and it's important to know this, to just understand it, to follow the presentation. At the broadest level, there's the kingdom, um, and at the narrowest, there's the strain. Um, we mostly think about bacteria in terms of genus and species, which are fairly, um, you know, they're, they're fairly specific, but nothing is as specific as the strain. So what do these organisms do? Well, they alter, they create, they destroy, they recycle. They may make nutrients more or less bioavailable. They stimulate immune responses, modify your systemic meta metabolism, alter the motility of your gut, compete with pathogens, and they activate something called the enteric nervous system, also known as the second brain, which connects directly with your first brain. Um, and one of the important effects is that they synthesize unique substances, which are called postbiotics. Now, there's a, the complexity and diversity of the microbiome is really extreme. Uh, bacteria and archaea look alike under the microscope, but they exist in separate kingdoms. You know, plants and animals exist in separate kingdoms. Lactobacilli and bifidobacteria are considered to be similar probiotics but they actually are in separate phyla. Now, humans and eels occupy the same phylum. So you can imagine the diversity if these two organisms that are often lumped together are actually in different phyla. And on the other hand, different strains of the same species may have divergent, even opposite effects. Bacteroides fragilis is an important uh, component of the microbiome. Well, some strains have been shown to prevent autism and others to promote colon cancer. In general, health is associated with a greater variety of taxa at all levels, with diversity and balance that create healthy ecosystems. Groups of unrelated taxa support one another by creating interdependent feeding networks. And so the microbiome really, is, it's not even a single ecosystem. It is a series of complex, dynamic, interacting microbial communities. Within those communities, there are species called keystone species, uh, like the keystone in an arch, a keystone species. Uh, keystone species are major taxa that support all the other species, holding the whole system or set of systems together. Now, the relationship between COVID-19 and the microbiome starts with the fact that the virus, SARS-CoV-2, invades the intestinal lining and may persist for months. It's present in stool samples of patients with acute COVID-19. In 3% of patients, it the viral RNA persisted for up to seven months. 
Is this significant? Well, in patients with inflammatory bowel disease who had, were undergoing routine colonoscopies, the SARS-CoV-2 RNA was seen in their intestinal biopsies seven months after the initial infection. In those patients who still had symptoms, it was not seen in patients who did not have symptoms. So viral RNA and protein was found on intestinal biopsy seven months after mild acute COVID-19, unrelated to the severity of the initial infection, to medication use, or to the degree of inflammation in the gut. It did not grow on culture, and there was no viral RNA or protein in the stool. So these may just have been remnants. But the symptoms of long COVID were reported from the majority of patients who showed this viral persistence, and not from those without viral persistence. Now, that doesn't tell us about the microbiome, but it does tell us about the importance of um, intestinal infection and persistence with the virus. Now, there's been a lot of speculation that bacterial dysbiosis may increase the severity of acute COVID-19. And there's no direct measurement of this, but there's a very important study that was done with healthcare workers that divided them into people who had had a mild or minimal asymptomatic infection or a moderate or severe infection. And it then looked at their diet retrospectively during the year before they got COVID-19 using well-standardized and validated questionnaires. This was done in six studies and it was covered, conducted by really top researchers um, from US universities, um, Harvard, Johns Hopkins. Um, what they found was that those healthcare workers who had been following low carbohydrate, high protein diets, were four times more likely to experience a moderate or severe infection compared with those following pesco-vegetarian diets who mostly had mild or asymptomatic infections. When they quantitated it, what they found was that a 40% increase in vegetable consumption produced a 70% decrease in the incidence of moderate to severe infection. Now, it didn't change whether they got infected or not. It was just the severity of the infection. What is the significance of this? Well, high protein, low carbohydrate diets have been shown to alter the gut microbiome in predictable ways. And it turns out that this is the same way that COVID-19 itself alters the gut microbiome. And this is a recent study of patients who were hospitalized and they took people hospitalized with COVID-19. This is early in the pandemic but it was just published. This was before there was immunization. They compared them with equally sick patients hospitalized with non-COVID pneumonia, receiving similar care, um, the same drugs this, um, which were available at that time, the same level of respiratory care. The specific presence of COVID-19, as opposed to any other factor, produced unique changes in, the, in gut bacteria. They were not present at the time of hospitalization. They emerged over seven days. So this is clearly the result of a specific effect of COVID-19 on the gut microbiome. And it was exactly the changes you see with a low carb diet and a low fiber diet. There was an increase in the ratio of, two, of one family called bacteroidetes to another, Firmicutes. This is a very important ratio because these are major bacterial families. And within the Bacteroides family, um, Bacteroides family, there was um, an increase in the ratio of Bacteroides to Prevotella. This is what you get when you produce, when you follow a low carb diet, um, and it is the same change produced by COVID nineteen. Okay, well, <clears throat> um, what are the mechanisms that might be involved here? Uh, one is that COVID-19 as an infection can impact gut microbial defenses directly. The virus infects the small and large intestine by attaching to its most common cellular receptor, an enzyme called ACE2. Now, viral attachment damages ACE2, impairing its function. Aside from what it does throughout the body, where it is an important anti-inflammatory molecule, 
In the gut, ACE2 is needed for the absorption of large neutral amino acids, especially tryptophan. Tryptophan is very important for immune function. Intestinal ACE2 deficit has been shown to deplete serotonin and also to, which is derived from tryptophan, and also to decrease the synthesis of antimicrobial peptides called beta defensins. Loss of these defensins can create gut microbial dysbiosis. Now, <clears throat> there are changes that occur in the microbiome with acute COVID-19 that persist for months. And some of this is due to the loss of defensins and the dysbiosis that occurs. There's a decrease in bacterial diversity and an increase in the pro-inflammatory species. There's an increase in the growth of yeast and other, uh, and other fungi, in particular Candida albicans, Candida auris, a very dangerous yeast that's been receiving a lot of attention lately because its incidence is increasing, and a toxic mold called Aspergillus flavus were shown to increase. The keystone depleted species is a species called Fecalobacterium prausnitzi. You don't necessarily need to remember its name. It's not available as a probiotic. But Fecalobacterium prausnitzi really is important in the health of the gut microbiome. Now, it was also found that antibiotics could aggravate the dysbiosis of COVID-19, and that full recovery from COVID was associated with the return to normal of Fecalobacterium prausnitzi. One of the effects of Fecalobacterium prausnitzi is that it is, a, it is a major source of a postbiotic called butyrate, which has significant protective effects throughout the body. And I'll be saying more about butyrate in a moment. Now, this is a very important study, which looked at the gut microbiome at disease onset and found that the gut microbiome at the onset of acute COVID could predict the development of long COVID. The patients who went on to develop prolonged symptoms had a loss, persistent loss of Fecalobacterium prausnitzi in their gut microbiome. They also had high levels of Ruminococcus navis. This is a potentially toxic organism that I'll talk about. And at least one species of Bacteroides were much higher compared to those people who recovered fully. And there was a marked decrease in the production of butyrate, especially due to the loss of Fecalobacterium prausnitzi and a species of Bifidobacterium. And those actually showed the largest inverse correlation with the presence of long COVID six months later. Now, what are the functions of butyrate in the gut? Well, it nourishes the intestine, especially the large intestine. It supplies about 70% of the energy needed by the large intestine. It is anti-inflammatory. It decreases the synthesis of inflammatory proteins. It prevents colon cancer. Um, it enhances the gut barrier, decreasing the leakiness, and it modulates pain sensation and gut motility. Outside the GI tract, butyrate has very important anti-inflammatory and healing effects. And butyrate is what is called a short-chain volatile fatty acid. It passes readily through membranes as if they're not there. So whatever is produced in your gut is absorbed into your body and gets to your brain. It acts as what is called a histone deacetylase inhibitor. It turns on genes that have been silenced. And in the brain, it increases the production of a healing molecule called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And that stimulates the recovery of neurons from injury. It also activates regulatory mo mo molecules on cell membranes um, that some of, for some of which it is the only thing that is activating those. And they're mostly anti-inflammatory. Now, ruminococcus, on the other hand, has some very negative effects in the body. It consumes and thins the intestinal mucus layer, increasing permeability. It actually reduces the level of tryptophan by converting it 
to an amine, an amine called tryptamine, which can trigger migraines and interfere with circulation. And all organisms in the genus Ruminococcus produce a substance called isoamilanine. This is a neurotoxic postbiotic. Butyrate is a healing probiotic. Isoamilanine is a neurotoxic probiotic that causes cognitive dysfunction by destroying the glial cells that support neurons in the brain. So the question that I've raised is to what extent is the development of long COVID influenced by gut microbial dysbiosis, the loss of F. prausnitzi and bifidobacteria, decreased synthesis of butyrate, overgrowth of ruminococci and maybe other toxic species, increased intestinal permeability. And that has actually been measured um, by looking at the level in blood of something called zonulin, a protein that is an indicator of permeability. Adults with long COVID have an increase in plasma zonulin. And in children who have this very um, severe complication of COVID called MIS-C, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, elevated zonulin is associated with other markers of leaky gut and with the persistence of virus in the stool. And those children respond better to treatment when they are given a substance that corrects the leaky gut by reducing zonulin. Now, there was an interesting study from Brazil which attempts to answer the question, does the mic gut microbiome directly create symptoms of long COVID? So of course they did this in laboratory animals and mice and these were, um, and they gave them fecal transplants from two groups of people. One were patients who had had mild COVID-19 within the past four months, and the other were their healthy family members who did not have COVID. And they chose that because family members tend to have very similar gut microbiomes. And there was no live virus in any of the transplants. Well, the mice who were given the Co the post-COVID feces showed increased inflammation in their lungs around blood vessels and bronchial tubes, not just in the gut. And these, when these mice were given a bacterial infection, they got much sicker. Uh, we've certainly seen that after COVID-19, that many people are more susceptible to a variety of types of infection. Uh, they also showed something they sh that has been described after COVID-19 in humans which is impaired visual spatial memory. And that was associated with an increase in brain inflammation and a reduction in the levels of BDNF. That's that protective protein that is stimulated by butyrate. Um, there were almost 400 proteins expressed differently in the brains of post-COVID transplant mice compared to controls. Some of these abnormalities could be partially improved with a probiotic. This was one that they obtained from the stool of healthy Brazilian children. It's called Bifidobacterium longum, and it's a particular strain, 5-1-A. Um, so in this study, we see that the alterations of the gut microbiome produced by having COVID-19 can produce, can create changes very much like what we see in long COVID in laboratory animals. Um, and some of these may be overcome by a particular probiotic. Now, there are other species of Bifidobacterium longum available, and one of them, uh, BB536, has been studied in human clinical trials. It is anti-inflammatory. In adults, it decreases the symptoms of cedar pollen allergy. And in children, it decreases the rates of respiratory infection. These immune-supportive anti-inflammatory effects are associated with an increase in the levels of Fecalobacterium prausnitzi in stool. So there appears to be a significant link between Bifidobacteria, F. prausnitzi, and respiratory health. Now, uh, another study which was done um, in the US found uh, not only was there an, a leaky gut, this increase in plasma zonulin in patients who had long COVID, but associated with this leaky gut there was an increase in a fungal 
cell wall pop product called beta-glucan circulating in the blood, indicating that this leakiness was either was allowing components of fungi to get into the blood. Now, beta-glucan has um, very strong um, stimulating effects on inflammation and immunity. And the higher beta-glucan correlated with nausea, diarrhea, visual problems, insomnia, neuropathy, pain, more symptoms, and reduced quality of life. It also correlated with higher markers of inflammatory proteins in blood. And when this blood was taken from plasma from the long COVID patients and, get, and used in a laboratory model, it created inflammation in that model. And the level of inflammation was directly related to the beta-glucan. The implication is that the leaky gut that's produced, that's associated with long COVID, probably produced by acute COVID, can create systemic symptoms and inflammation by allowing the transport of fungal components and other toxic substances into blood. Now, there's an, another body of research, quite fascinating, needs to be explored further, that's being done in Italy, where these researchers determined that the SARS-CoV-2 virus not only could would appear in stool, but it would replicate in cultures of normal bacteria acting as a bacteriophage. This is a very unusual situation, but not unheard of, in which a human virus can actually infect bacteria. In particular, and I think this is important, Fecalobacterium prausnitzi was a, a very important reservoir of infection. Now, bacteriophages tend to kill the bacteria that they infect. And of all the um, normal healthy bacteria studies, F. prausnitzi historically is the most susceptible to bacteriophage invasion. So it raises the question, is the loss of beneficial bacteria during COVID-19 caused directly by bacteriophage ca capacity of SARS-CoV-2, in addition to everything else that I've discussed? And also, do these infected bacteria serve as a reservoir for persistence of live virus or viral proteins um, in humans? Well, we don't know very much about it because most of the research done on bacteriophages has been done with DNA viruses and SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus. So there, there's a lot to be explored there. Now, with regard to treatment, how do we restore a healthy gut microbiome in the interests of overcoming long COVID? Diet lays the foundation and a pesca vegetarian type diet or a vegetarian diet, a diet that is high in fiber and in the polyphenols found in plant foods. This has been shown in numerous studies to increase the growth of F. prausnitzi and the production of butyrate. Um, adherence to a, to a sort of classic Mediterranean diet, diet has been shown to elevate fecal levels of F. prausnitzi. There are prebiotics that may be helpful. These are complex sugars. Um, fructo and galacto-oligosaccharides. They not only increase F. prausnitzi in laboratory animals, they increase the level of BDNF in the memory centers of the brain. Um, probiotic bifidobacteria, like BV536, and postbiotic butyrate, administered as a pill, sodium butyrate, may also be beneficial in reversing the impact of COVID-19 on the gut microbiome. Now, the good news here is that this kind of diet rich in polyphenols uh, and bioflavonoids, which are a type of polyphenols, these disable or kill bacteriophages by inducing structural damage to their capsules, inhibiting their activity and infectivity. Um, and so this kind of diet will diminish the bacteriophage activity if there is one of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, a plant-based diet also has been shown to reduce levels of Ruminococcus novus uh, in humans and in animals. And there's a particular component, malvitin, an anthocyanin that is found in berries that specifically reduces the growth of R. navis in animals. So we have a diet that can accomplish many things and it happens to be a healthy diet and one that is 
quite delicious and um, ancestral and familiar to many people. Um, there are some other steps that can be taken beyond diet. One might be to stop viral proliferation in the gut using synthetic or natural antivirals. The synthetic antiviral Paxlovid appears to decrease the incidence of long COVID by about 40%. Um, we can also reduce gut, gut inflammation with a number of measures that I'll get to in a moment. Um, try to restore the mucus layer and the integrity of the tight junctions so the leaky gut is overcome and, and, and then take other steps to reverse gut bacterial dysbiosis. There is a particular probiotic, a soil-derived organism, and a strain of the bacterial species Bacillus subtilis. Um, this is B7092 that was isolated from Siberian tundra in the 1960s, developed as an immune-boosting probiotic by Soviet scientists. Um, it was con work was continued in Ukraine under the name Sobolin and in Russia under the name Betome 1.1. In the US, it's come uh, under the name Tundrix. And um, this has antiviral activity. Um, in my own practice, I found it useful for restoring a healthy mu gut microbiome after the treatment of GI infection. And it can even combat some bacterial infections of the gut, according to clinical trials done in Russia. Um, there are a number of natural products that can control intestinal inflammation to interrupt that vicious cycle of inflammation creates nitrates, which foster the growth of inflammatory bacteria, which creates more nitrates. And among these, those that have been shown to be effective are quercetin, a bioflavonoid that is available as a supplement, mastic gum, the gum resin of pasticcia lentiscus, which is used in the Mediterranean in making rice pudding. It's available as a food or a supplement. Curcumin from the spice turmeric, uh, used in South Asia, but now used globally. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids uh, found in certain seeds and also in fish, in oily fish. Magnolia bark extract, um, which has mostly been studied in Chinese medicine. Uh, and an interesting product, which are bovine serum immunoglobulins, um, antibodies found in the blood of cattle that are then taken as a supplement. And I've seen some pretty profound immune modulating effects in the gut in patients with GI symptoms with using these. And there is a version of them that is being used in inflammatory bowel disease uh, as a medication. So those are steps that can be taken to reverse the microbial dysbiosis and the leaky gut that is associated with long COVID. And we will need studies to see whether this correction of microbial dysbiosis can have a clinically significant impact on the, on the symptoms of long COVID. My own personal investigations as a clinician are that it plays a significant role, but we'll need controlled studies to document how much of a role. Thank you very much, Dr. Gallen, for this uh, fascinating um, uh, summary of where research stands uh, today. And with more than 20 million uh, people suffering with long COVID uh, symptoms around the world, I think that um, obviously this is one of the very interesting areas of research to help um, alleviate people's suffering in this uh, field. So big thank you for your time and this uh, wonderful tour of where we stand in terms of research. Thank you, Dr. Gallen. Okay. Thank you, Sophie. It was a pleasure being able to present this uh, for your foundation. Thank you.